make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> The, the challenge is what also comes into the NAR is not just this model of church governance, but they begin their theology begins to take on ideas of taking over society, of becoming deeply involved in politics, and not just politics as in like, oh, we're going to go vote, but actually a politics of taking over, politics of what I call in the, in the mm-hmm. podcast series Christian supremacy where they very much have an agenda that says Christians need to take over society. Um, These are folks, by and large, who do not believe in the separation of church and state. Um, And so their theology calls them to take over. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Hey, doing well, Will. Thanks. Hey, and this week we have with us um, Matthew D. Taylor. Doctor, should I call you Dr. Taylor? Matt is fine. Matt, okay. So we have with us Matt, um, Seth Rogen lookalike, um, who is the (laughs) Protestant scholar at Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies, where he specializes in Muslim Christian dialogue, evangelical and Pentecostal movements, religious politics in the U.S., and American Islam. He's also the creator of the Claim audio documentary series, Charismatic Revival Fury, the Apostolic Reformation, which details how networks of extremist Christian leaders helped instigate the January 6th insurrection. And I should also add that you can catch it on the Straight White American Jesus podcast. So welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, so um, you are somebody that we have been wanting to talk to for a while um, because of the work you do and kind of it's tie in to the, the, the premise of our of our podcast, which which I I do have to just start off and say we started this podcast three years ago, not or at least me personally, not knowing anything at all about the new apostolic reformation. Um, about how bad Christian nationalism is in this country <laughs> and and that it would ultimately lead me to talk to someone that basically, you know, made this his career field. So 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 I guess my, my question is, why is this your career field? So um, as you mentioned in the introduction, I actually my, my PhD is actually in Muslim Christian dialogue and kind of Islam and Christianity where they intersect. Um, and my my first book is about um, the Salafi movement in the U.S., the, um, which is often labeled radical Islam or fundamentalist Islam. Um, and, and it's actually a very positive assessment of the Salafi community in the U.S., the ways that they actually are very similar to evangelicals. Um, and I spent a number of years writing that book. It was my dissertation that became my book. And I sent it off to the publisher on the morning of January 6th, 2021. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, okay, now I can finally just take a breath, take a break. I've, I, I, it's out of my hands for, for the time being. And then obviously that afternoon I'm, I'm watching the Capitol riot, trying to keep my preschool age children from seeing it while also trying to like <laughs> pay attention myself. And, um, and just realizing as I'm watching that. And then as I start following up and trying to read up a little bit more, I, I'm like, I, I actually know quite a bit about this, both from my research, but also just from my own background and upbringing and all. Um, and, um, and so I just started digging and digging deeper and um, spent the last two plus years really trying to understand who were the Christian leaders, who were, what was the theology that was informing the capital riot? And that is what actually led me to the New Apostolic Reformation. I was hazily aware of the NAR before that. um, And it was really through, within within about a month of researching, I had kind of locked in and was like, nope, this is, this is what the next book is right here. That that's really cool. Now, so so our our audience is is pretty mixed. I mean, we've got um, a mix of you know believers, non believers, Democrats, Republicans, what have you. So the term New Apostolic Reformation um, can easily sound just like Christianese to mm-hmm. the person that's never heard it before. So can you can you give an overview of you know what the New Apostolic Reformation is and kind of its core beliefs? Sure. Yeah. So um, the term New Apostolic Reformation was coined in uh, the 1990s 
by a seminary professor named C. Peter Wagner. He was a professor at Fuller Seminary for about 30 years. Um, I went to Fuller Seminary. I, I um, started there in 2004. Peter Wagner left in 1999. So we didn't, we never overlapped there. Um, but I knew a lot of people there who were influenced by him. Um, a lot of the coursework that I did there was uh, influenced by some of his thoughts. So um, I was kind of aware of him uh, there. So the this idea of the New Apostolic Reformation, though, it, it the, some of the ideas go back a ways. Um, so this is within the world of Pentecostal charismatic Christianity, um, very important segment of Christianity, growing rapidly um, around the world, growing rapidly in the United States. Um, and it's especially focused on uh, a sub-segment of Pentecostal charismatic Christianity, you usually divide up, uh, at least scholars usually divide up Pentecostal charismatic Christianity into three segments. So there's Pentecostalism proper um, that, uh, at least in the U.S., really kicks off around the Azusa Street Revival. And then you form, this is in 1906, 1907 uh, in Los Angeles. And then they form different Pentecostal denominations coming out of that. Um, Church of God in Christ, Assemblies of God, Foursquare Gospel, these sorts of things. And then there's the Charismatic Renewal or the mainline charismatics. These are um, the Catholic charismatics, mainline Protestant charismatics. That movement really gets started in the 1960s. And it's this third segment that the NAR is really a part of. And that is what's usually called independent charismatic, um, or sometimes called independent network charismatic uh, Christianity. So these are non-denominational charismatic folks. Um, so people who um, may attend mega churches, they might just follow online ministries of pastors and prophets and apostles. Um, and the NAR, the idea of it, at least Peter Wagner's original idea of it, is that um, he came to believe um, through hanging out with a bunch of these independent charismatic folks. And Wagner ultimately uh, became very invested in this. But the idea is that the church has been languishing for centuries without the leadership of apostles and prophets. And these folks are very fond of reading the book of Ephesians very carefully. It's the kind of the, the canon within the canon of the Bible for them. Um, and in the book of Ephesians, at a couple of points, it starts listing out the different leadership roles in the church. And especially in Ephesians chapter four, it lists out five leadership roles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. And Peter Wagner and others begin to argue in the 1990s, well, you know, we, we've got evangelists and teachers and pastors. Everybody is in agreement that those are part of the church. Why don't we have apostles and prophets anymore? Um, and so part of the idea is of the New Apostolic Reformation is that the Holy Spirit in the 21st century is empowering new apostles and prophets to take leadership in the church. Um, I would characterize the NAR um, as part of this broader apostolic and prophetic movement. Um, so the NAR, I, I see as one network centered around Peter Wagner and his disciples within this bigger apostolic prophetic movement. And that apostolic prophetic movement is growing just gangbusters around the world right now. You have thousands of people now saying that they are apostles, thousands of people saying they are prophets, um, and uh, taking leadership over churches. And part of the idea of the NAR is that apostles are supposed to build networks of churches, so instead of a denominational structure that is built around bylaws, committees, kind of collective governance, um, the apostolic network is centered around personalities, centered around the personality of these apostles, and the prophets are seen as kind of advisors to the apostles. Um, they, they're the ones who hear directly from God, and then the apostles are kind of supernaturally commissioned to build these things. Um, part of the, the story I tell in this Charismatic Revival of Fury um, documentary series that we did um, is about, it's about NAR and it's about January 6th, but I'm also trying to lay out the history of the NAR, where it comes from, how it develops. Um, so over time, some of the core beliefs that you asked about, um, the, the, the big one at the start is this idea of apostles and prophets govern the church. Um, and, and so Peter Wagner leaves Fuller Seminary in 1999 and decides he's going to build this new apostolic reformation um, starts building all these institutions, gathering friends, building these networks, um, gathering leaders that he's going to mentor. Um, and within a couple of years of that, he becomes very enamored with the idea of the seven mountain mandate, which I'm sure we can talk about more. Um, and this idea of kind of Christians taking dominion over society, something called dominion theology. 
um, that largely comes out of the Reformed world, but then has uh, become very popular amongst independent charismatics. Um, and, and then the, the other really core idea or practice of the NAR is what uh, Peter Wagner called strategic spiritual warfare. The idea that um, there are territorial spirits. This is, again, a Peter Wagner phrase. He has a book called Territorial Spirits. Um, that that there, The idea is that church, I mean, a lot of Christians believe in spiritual warfare. It's very, very common belief, fairly mainstream in evangelical Christianity. But the idea of strategic spiritual warfare is, um, right, regular spiritual warfare is, oh, I've, I've I'm plagued by personal demons or uh, demons are, are challenging or attacking my family and we need to pray against those. We need to do some praise music or have, have a, a prayer session to cast out those demons or to defend ourselves against them. Well, strategic spiritual warfare is the idea that hierarchies of demons have taken over literal physical territory. And so there's a territorial spirit who has power over a particular region and that Christians need to organize in these uh, prayer and spiritual warfare campaigns to take out those territorial spirits, those, those high-ranking demons. Um, and I argue um, that actually these ideas, the Seven Mountain Mandate, Apostolic Prophetic Governance, and the Strategic Spiritual Warfare were actually core to what happened on January 6th. You actually can't understand the Christian manifestations uh, that happen around the Capitol riot without actually understanding the, these NAR ideas and how they became kind of activating and galvanizing for so many of the people who showed up that day. Yeah, it's it's weird because uh, I'm wondering, wondering if, if a lot of those folks that showed up at the Capitol on that day were responding to the the portal that was floating over the white house um that um roger stone had had posted about he said there was like a, a demon portal <laughs> or something like that that was over the 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 white house and we don't have to spend too much time there but uh but but the but but the the new apostolic Refor F reformation sort of implies that there is an old one is that is that correct and what is that old one so so Wagner would say that the the church in the 21st century he actually said 2001 was the start of the second apostolic age. Um, the first apostolic age would be the early church, right? Where you have the original apostles, the disciples of Jesus, leading the church, founding the church, um, and then building the church. Um, and and it really creating the theology, helping to compose the New Testament, right? That would be the first apostolic age. Okay. And then Wagner believed that the Holy Spirit was going to do this new work and that he believed he was very much a part of that work to kind of inaugurate a new era in the church that he called the Second Apostolic Age, where you have new apostles stepping forward to lead the church. So that's the new piece of it. And then apostolic, I mean, apostolic is a, is a, uh, adjective that shows up a lot in Christianity, right? Because it's just saying attached to the apostles. But in this case, what, what Wagner is referring to is that you have new apostles, right? New people who are coming forward as apostles. Now, they, they sometimes will nuance it and say they're not, they don't have as much authority as the original apostles per se, but these are the people that they believe God has anointed to actually lead the church forward into revival, into reformation, and Wagner would talk about at the time that he thought that this would be a new branch of Christianity, right? This is the Reformation piece of it, that he thought that this was going to be a, a branch of Christianity equivalent to the Protest Protestantism or Eastern Orthodoxy or Catholicism. It was going to be this major new branch. That's not that, that his terminology has not really borne out. It's not it, people in the charismatic world do not continue using this terminology today, but you really do have this burgeoning apostolic and prophetic movement that's built upon similar ideas. Not all of that is coming directly from Wagner. There were a lot of people talking about this at the time. And so Wagner tried to kind of brand a particular style of this apostolic and prophetic Christianity. Um, but the independent charismatic world, as I said, is, is growing rapidly and these ideas are spreading rapidly through it. That's absolutely fascinating. Trying to figure out the, the NAR um, movement. We've had different, um, Professors on one of uh, Andre Gagne, Gagne, mm -hmm. you know Andre, yeah, Gagne, yeah, yeah. So he was Gagne. How do how do you say it? I think I think it's Gagne. Gagne, Gagne. Yeah. What is one one of, one of them? One of them. So it. So I and he talked to us a lot about it. But you have these. You have prophets. You have apostles, and they're supposed to take over. Are they supposed to take over current churches, and put their like up apostolic imprimatur on them and approval 
And is that like, like how much you, you say this is growing, but how much is this? Give us a, give us a sense of the depth of what they're aiming to do. Mm-hmm. Like why we should care as Christians. And then as non-Christians, um, what they're aiming to do, how, how successful are that have they been doing it? And what, what do we need to like, what do we need to do in the future to <laughs> deal with this? And I know you might forget all those questions, but you get the general idea. Just kind of riff on what's going on with with them right now in America and this church, because I know we've been talking about that. Sure. So uh, the in terms of what they're hoping to do, yes, they are hoping to um, gather more churches. They, they want to start new churches. And so um, the apostles are frequently starting new churches. That's part of what they understand their role to be. But they also want to capture, you could use the term, the co-opt, draw in, um, in invest current churches. Um, and you see this happening very widely today, where churches will leave their denominational affiliation um, and then join one of these apostolic networks, become a non-denominational church. Um, but then non-denominationalism doesn't have a clear governance, right? Like to be non-denominational is to say, I'm not something. It isn't to say I am something. And so part of what these apostolic networks offer to non-denominational churches is they say, hey, look, we have this amazing apostle and you can come join up with our apostolic network and we will send our people in to be guest speakers in your church. Your pastors and leaders can come attend our leadership conferences. And all you need to do is say that you align with us and look to our apostle for guidance. And we'll bring all this kind of infrastructure of support to your church. Very prominently, and this news actually just broke within the last week, or at least just came out with, with real clarity. The Anaheim Vineyard which was the, the the flagship vineyard church. This was John Wimber's church. It was the, 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 the vineyard people back in the 80s and 90s called the Anaheim Vineyard the mothership. It was, it was the, the, the kind of top church, the flagship of the, the vineyard movement. And just within the last uh, few years, the pastors, uh, they, there were a, some new, a couple who were new pastors who came in. They came from the vineyard, but they were very influenced by these apostolic and prophetic circles. They took the Anaheim Vineyard with its 60 plus million dollars of assets out of the Vineyard Church Association, out of the denomination. And they said, we're just an independent church now. But what actually came out within the last week through some some reporting that, wow. that uh, was done was they actually are, that, that the pastor who was there has actually started calling himself an apostle, has started claiming that through prophetic words that he has received, that he has absolute power. He's now being accused of spiritual abuse of a number of the people in the congregation. So if, if all we were talking about here was just a model of church governance, Right. If this was just, oh, this is just a different form of church governance, kind of like denominations or kind of like an association right. of churches, a fellowship. I, I, don't, I don't think I'd be doing the research I'm doing because on, on some level, yeah. that's fine. If, if you want to have, if your ecclesiology, right, if your theology of the church says it should be governed by apostles and prophets on some level, <laughs> have at it. Right. I think that sure. that is a, that, that that's a, you're setting up a system that is personality driven that is going to be prone yeah. to abuse, prone to authoritarianism. But like, it's, if yeah. it's just, we're just talking about kind of ecclesiology and models of church governance, whatever. The, the challenge is what also comes into the NAR is not just this model of church governance, but they begin, their theology begins to take on ideas of taking over society, of becoming deeply involved in politics, and not just politics as in like, oh, we're going to go vote, but actually a politics of taking over politics of what I call in the, in the mm-hmm. podcast series, Christian supremacy, where they very much have an agenda that says Christians need to take over society. Um, these are folks by and large who do not believe in the separation of church and state. Um, and so their theology in, calls them to take over. To, to become, and this is, again, this idea of dominion, that the church is supposed to have dominion over the earth. And so this is the theology then that draws them into supporting Donald Trump. And it's also the theology that brings them to January 6th, because they believe that supporting Donald Trump requires that they do spiritual warfare, that they take on what they believe are demons who've taken over 
the Congress and uh, both parties in Congress, really, and that they believed that they needed to be there on January 6th in order to fight against those demons, conquer that territory, and take America back for God. So how exactly, how exactly were, are they fighting demons? Well, I guess, so how are they fighting demons, and how does someone become an apostle or a prophet just self-proclaimed? Um, is there a process? What, what are we looking at here? So they would bristle at the phrase self-proclaimed. They really don't like when people say that because in their minds, they are not self-proclaimed. So in, in their mind, the, um, you become an apostle by being gifted as an apostle by the Holy Spirit. And then having a community recognize your gifting as an apostle, um, and so for from so their as long as you have a community that recognizes, you're good. Well, it, and, and so, I guess that <laughs> in, in in Wagner's theology, it's actually apostles who recognize other apostles. So mm. it's the, the, it, he has he has this idea of apostolic attraction. Apostles are drawn to other apostles and begin to recognize and, and ordain other apostles. Apostolic attraction. <laughs> it's like, yeah. hey, g- hey, game recognizes game, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and really, I mean, Wagner had very high standards in terms of what who he would call an apostle. He helps to create an organization called the International Coalition of Apostles. Um, and um, he has very strict standards. It's all, he is, it's his organization and he gets to determine who comes in. It's supposed to be a professional society for these kind of uh, newfound apostles, but he gets to say who's coming in. And he says, if you have not founded multiple churches that have been successful, if you have not got multiple ministries going on at the same time, if you have not proven that you can take a church from a hundred people to 500 people in the space of a few years, then you probably are not gifted as an apostle. So the people that do wind up being identified as apostles, I'm sure people can pop off and say, well, I'm an apostle, right? And maybe their church says it or not. But in Wagner's system, to be accepted as an apostle, you have to have a proven track record of phenomenal leadership in terms of growth. Wagner was a specialist and his training was in a field called church growth um, that really grew up in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and so he's very fixated on growth, on how do you help churches to grow methodologically, theologically. And so for him, this stuff is all about the expansion of the church and apostles are the vehicle that God is using to expand the church. You did ask about how how rapidly this is growing and where, um, and it is is I mean it is incredible when you start digging in. Um, there's different names that get attached to this idea. So, uh, as I said, the ter- the terminology New Apostolic Reformation virtually no one uses that in these circles anymore. Once Wagner died in 2016, people kind of moved away from that. It became very politicized. And you'll find today, if, I mean, if you Google New Apostolic Reformation, you're going to find some really wacky stuff because there's a lot of kind of conspiracy theorists who d- d- dived into this stuff and created websites around it. And I'm trying to really ground this stuff historically in Wagner and his, his people. But um, th- these ideas have uh, spread across the American church very rapidly. And today you are seeing thousands of churches attach themselves to these apostolic networks. And sometimes you can tell just by looking at their website, sometimes you have to be very deep in leadership in the church to even know about some of these apostolic networks. Just to give one example. So one of Wagner's disciples is a guy named Che On. He's Korean American. Um, He actually studied under Wagner at Fuller Seminary, did his MDiv and his doctorate in ministry at Fuller Seminary. He now pastors a large church in Pasadena, California called Harvest Rock Church. And in the late 90s, uh, Che On, uh, kind of under mentorship and guidance by Peter Wagner, starts uh, his own apostolic network called Harvest International Ministry. And it starts out with about 14 churches. Um, Today, Harvest International Ministry, this this apostolic network under Che On, has over 25,000 churches and ministries that, atta- that follow Che on in 65 countries around the world, right? So that's, that's not, wow. th- that is bigger than a lot of denominations, right? But yeah. that, is, that is just the apostolic network of one NAR leader, Che on, and with his kind of global reach, right? So that, and, and, and I, they, you know, they don't break the numbers out by country, but I would estimate definitely hundreds, probably well into the thousands of those churches are in the U.S., that are following Che'on and looking to him as their apostolic leader. So 
we're, we're, we're not talking small bore here. This stuff is, is rapidly taking over the independent charismatic landscape. Well, so, so I'd imagine most people probably aren't familiar with, you know, names like Wagner or Lance Wallnow and, and all those others. So, uh, but based on kind of like your summary, it sounds like the new apostolic reformation group, um, is a group that we probably should be more con- uh, cognizant of kind of in our, in our just general everyday dialogue about faith and politics and, and what have you. But, but like, what are, what are some of the, the bigger names that mm-hmm. are involved kind of in this movement um, that people would recognize? Yeah. And this is where I, I'll, I'll sometimes make a technical distinction and say some of the people that a lot of people may think of, as being NAR, I would actually argue are not NAR because they were not people who were really close to Wagner. They might be close to people who are, are in Wagner's networks and are part of his circle. So like Bill Johnson and Bethel Church in Redding, California is often cited as this is this is the NAR church. It's actually not NAR. Uh, it is apostolic and prophetic. And it cross-pollinates with a lot of the NAR people. But Bill Johnson and Chris Vallotton, Bill Johnson's the apostle at Bethel, um, and Chris Vallotton is the prophet there. Um, and they they were not in Wagner's networks. They were friends with a lot of people in his networks. They Actually, Bill Johnson and Che On are best friends. Um, but the, Bill Johnson never kind of attached himself to what Wagner was doing. So when I talk about the NAR, I really am speaking about these networks that Wagner built. And Wagner had um, this mentoring group called the Eagles Vision Apostolic Team. Um, and it, it was about 25 to 30 people. Um, and uh, they were all apostles and prophets. Um, and these were the people that actually called Wagner their apostolic father um, or their spiritual father. And um, what I'm doing in, in Charismatic Revival Fury is I'm tracking, um, there are five members of this Eagles Vision Apostolic team who actually show up and are leading things on January 6th. Um, And there's about a dozen more of them out of the 30 that also help contribute to Donald Trump's kind of effort to steal the election. Um, And so I really argue that this this was kind of the nucleus at the core of Christian mobilization for January 6th was this Eagles Vision Apostolic team uh, of Wagner's people. So this includes people like Che On. Sydney Jacobs is one of the, the most famous prophets um, in the NAR. She was kind of Wagner's right-hand prophet. Chuck Pierce is another Eagles Vision Apostolic team member, another right-hand prophet to Peter Wagner. Dutch Sheets. Um, uh, Lance Wall now becomes a member of the Eagles Vision Apostolic team. Robert Henderson. Um, so you, you, yeah, Becca Greenwood is another person we profile in the in the series, who's kind of a noted prophet and spiritual warrior. Um, so these are these are kind of people that again they're probably not on the radar of even most conservative evangelicals. They probably haven't heard of these folks, but in this independent charismatic world, these people are mega celebrities and they, there's charismatic media like charisma news or God TV that really helps to kind of promote um, the, the ideas and carry the, the ideas of these folks out into the broader world. Man, I'm just fascinated by, I mean, we've, we've talked about this before in the show and every time I come back to it, I get fascinated again, like what's really going, it's like I talk about it, I think about it, I worry about it for like a few weeks, it was all I could talk about, (laughs) Will remembers, and then it kind of like, okay, we're moving on now, and then thinking about it again, so I want to make sure I have, I'm I'm understanding what you're saying, Mm -hmm. so the basic thesis is that I, you have this network wide network of like-minded individuals who are loosely associated. Like you have this, um, what, what, what was it that you were just talking about? I mean, what was it called again? It was the, it was like the Eagles vision, apostolic team, Eagles vision. Yeah. Apostolic, um, you know, group together, like, and all these well-known names. So you have these guys, then you see their relationship with Donald Trump. You see Mm -hmm. them speaking at Trump rallies, I assume, or at Trump, Um, like, you know, at at political things or speaking out in favor, calling him things like Cyrus or, uh, or, or making the, like, like, uh, an, an allusion to King Cyrus, the Persian, Mm -hmm. uh, King. And so, um, who God used, right? So the question though is like, (laughs) we, you have all these different, uh, you have all these different connections and then they were actually there. 
at January 6th. Yes. Is that what you're saying? There, that several of these people were there, like what, speaking, participating? I'm assuming none of them went into the Capitol, or did they? <laughs> so, as far as I can tell, no one who is close to Peter Wagner went into the Capitol. Um, so, gotcha. but part, part of the so, but a lot of them were there at absolutely. January 6th. I so I have tracked about 45. Uh, independent charismatic leaders who were there on January 6th, right? People, people have sometimes doesn't... said that that there's no pattern to the Christianity. There's no denominational pattern to the Christians who show up on January 6th. And I would agree with them because the pattern is they're all non-denominational. <laughs> or not all, but so many of them are non-denominational. That's the pattern is mm-hmm. they're, they're non-denominational and they're charismatic. And um, so, and those, those 45, it ranges from local pastors all the way up to international celebrities in the independent charismatic world, right? Cindy Jacobs is an, is, is an international celebrity, maybe one of the most respected prophets in the world, in the charismatic world today. She is there on January 6th, leading spiritual warfare over the Capitol with a PA system and a stage set up just off the site of the Capitol. Right. And so she's praying. That's what she's doing. She's praying out loud or something like that, like into a microphone, like, Yelling, screaming, praying. I mean, what, what, like, what kind of stuff is she doing? That's like supposed to be. Do you know, like, trying to defend the capital against demons? How does one do that? So, in their mind, um, apostles and prophets are generals of spiritual warfare. They they'll actually use this language, and and so they like, have like angels under their control or something like that, or un- yeah. So they so Cindy Jacobs leads an organization called Generals International. It used to be called Generals of Intercession, and the idea is hmm. so when these folks read the Great Commission, right? Jesus in Matthew chapter twenty eight, go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations. Right? Most Christians have read that, and we read it as make disciples in the nations. The NAR folks read it as, and this did not necessarily begin with Peter Wagner. This goes back a ways. They read it as the church should disciple nations. So in other words, the church needs to take over and then mentor nations into Christianity. And so in their mind, and this, this is where the idea of seven mountains comes in as well. In their mind, the, you can divide society up into these seven segments, the seven mountains. This is Lance Wallnow is the, the first one to really kind of create this formulation. Um, and the church, Christians need to take over all the seven mountains. And they need to do spiritual warfare to take over the government mountain, to take over the education mountain, and then govern from the top of those mountains to influence society. So part of the, way, the reason these folks so are so strongly in support of Donald Trump, and this is part of what I'm trying to tell in the series, everyone wonders, well, why did evangelicals support Trump? I'll tell you why at least this group of evangelicals support Trump. They saw him as a path to taking over the seven mountains. And they literally use this, cover, this, this idea that Trump can conquer the government mountain for us and govern from the top down. So when they show up on January 6th, part of it is they are anxious that they are going to lose the influence that they have in society if they lose the tops of the mountains. If, if somebody else, if Joe Biden is put in as president, then that's going to be a real problem for them because they, they, in their minds, Christianity is going to lose its cultural power. So what they're, what Cindy Jacobs specifically is doing that day, um, she and Becca Greenwood, who, as I said, is another mentee of Peter Wagner, they had a stage set up and they were doing strategic spiritual warfare. And so they believed that demons had taken over the Capitol. And I, I have audio in the series. There's video of them online doing this where they're literally praying. They say there is a demon named Leviathan that has taken over the Capitol building and is holding back lawmakers in the Capitol from reinstalling Donald Trump as president. And so we need to pray against these territorial spirits, these principalities and powers to in order that the the power of God. So we are calling down the angels from heaven and they believe that generals have that authority again, because they're apostles and prophets. So they have this special authority to call down angels to do battle against these demons. And they are also, they have thousands of people participating both on site and remotely through the internet in these prayer things. So Dutch sheets is um, he's, if you've ever looked at images from January 6th or other Christian nationalist rallies, and you see an appeal to heaven flag, which is a white flag with a green pine tree at the center. And it says an appeal to heaven across the top. 
Mm-hmm. That is that is a spiritual warfare campaign created by Dutch Sheets, who was also mentored by Peter Wagner, also part of the Eels Vision Apostolic team. He created this in 2013. It really ramps up in 2015 around the, the presidential election and becomes very much attached to Donald Trump. And if you look at the images of January 6th, you can see at least dozens, probably well into the hundreds of appeal to heaven flags in the crowds around the Capitol. And all those people are, are referencing back to this meme that Dutch Sheets has created about spiritual warfare and retaking America. And you even see people using those appeal to heaven flags in some of the videos to, to beat Capitol Police officers with the, the flag pulse that those appeal to heaven flags are on. So these this is, again, a, a form of mobilization for people. During the Capitol riot, Dutch Sheets is on a spiritual warfare prayer call, a conference call, and there are 4,000 people on that call in, law, in real time praying for the the, the Christians to, to have victory in the in the capital and for Donald Trump to be reinstated. Right? So that when, when you think about the that the the weird energy, the Christian energy of January 6th, I'm not saying that like right, I, I the, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the people who went into the Capitol, and there were some independent charismatics who did go into the Capitol, but they were it was just a handful. But the energy of the crowds, the Christian ethos in the crowds, was largely driven by these NAR theologies of spiritual warfare and by the campaigns that these NAR leaders created around the, the Capitol. One of the other things that we reveal um, in, the, in, the, in the podcast series that had not been previously reported, and this speaks to the the ties into Donald Trump. Dutch Sheets had a team of apostles and prophets that he was instigated by somebody in the government after the 2020 election to take this team to every swing state where the, the election results were being contested and they were supposed to prophesy and stir people up. And they were leading, they, they went to every swing state. Some of them they went to twice. They would go to mega churches and broad live cast these massive prayer, spiritual warfare, prophecy meetings, like incredibly violent rhetoric about cutting the heads off demons and cutting the heads off our enemies, all these sorts of images. That team, Dutch Sheets team, on December 29th, 2020, had a two-hour meeting at the White House with unnamed Trump administration officials where they talk about we were receiving strategy from the highest levels of government for how to get Donald Trump back in office. And then those many of those same people show up on January 6th and Dutch Sheets calls into the Capitol right on speakerphone to issue his own apostolic declarations along with Cindy Jacobs and Becca Greenwood, right? So these are the people who are stirring up the, this kind of sentiment of Christian Trumpism um, and doing it very much in coordination with the White House. <laughs> that's so crazy. <laughs> um, wow. Um, that's, that's all I really have to say about that. But uh, so, so you, you've mentioned a couple of times about the seven mountain mandate and I yep. like maybe for you to um, unpack that a little bit, but, but also you, you said something in the, um, in the podcast series, um, charismatic revival fury that I never heard before. And, and that was, uh, the seven mountain mandate didn't used to be mountains. They used to be spheres. Um, and I, I found that super interesting. So I was wondering if one, you can just sort of unpack what the seven mountain mandate is. I know we, you know, like we, we only have so much time, so feel free to dedicate as much as you want to that. And then, and then, you know, why, why, you know, there are mountains now when they used to be spheres. So, the story of the Seven Mountain Mandate actually goes back a ways. Um, the 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 legend of this, and <laughs> I I am deeply ambivalent on how much of this is true. Um, but in 1975, um, there's uh, two leaders of major campus ministries: Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade, and Lauren Cunningham, who is the founder of Youth with a Mission, which everyone calls YWAM. And they're meeting and they're having dinner in Colorado. And the legend goes that they, um, the night before they meet, um, they both have dreams where God reveals to them this idea that society has seven spheres of influence. They also call them the seven mind molders of culture. And, and that these, if, if Christians can go and influence these seven spheres, then, th- then you can disciple nations. Again, this idea of taking over nations. Right. And, and what Bright and Cunningham, um, the, what they describe, and, and Cunningham writes about this in a book that he writes in the 1980s. So you can find kind of the, the roots of it there. Um, is they, they, that, that Christians are supposed to influence 
these spheres. They're supposed to go out. So the spheres are things like arts and entertainment. And so the, so the, the idea that Bright and Cunningham are putting forward is more Christians should pursue careers in arts and entertainment. And then through their occupation of those, those areas of, of society, they can influence them positively for the gospel, right? Which I would argue is kind of a, a grassroots mm-hmm. model of evangelization, right? right. That, that, if, that Christians should involve themselves in society and get outside the doors of the church and involve themselves in society. That, sure. Whatever. That's, that's, I don't really care that much about that. The, yeah. What happens is in the year 2000, Lauren Cunningham, who's getting pretty old by that point and is kind of moving towards retirement, meets a young man named Lance Walnow, who is a Pentecostal pastor. And Walnow is kind of, he, he's, he's kind of bumping along in his career. He's got a background in business and motivational speaking. Doesn't really, his, his church that he's leading is not, not doing that great. And um, he's looking for the next thing. And he has this conversation with uh, Lauren Cunningham and hears about this idea of the seven spheres. And right around the same time, Lance Wall now hears from a friend about a, a, a friend's friend. So like an acquaintance of an acquaintance who had a near death experience mm-hmm. and they witnessed this, they had this vision during their near death experience of seven mountains coming out of the ocean. And they hear the voice of God speaking to them saying, these are the seven kingdoms of the world and you are called to the government kingdom. And then the guy in the story uh, who's having the near death experience agrees that he's supposed to go to the government mountain and comes out of the near death experience and goes into, to, to government work. Um, and so wall now blends these things together. So he takes the mountain imagery from the near death experience with the seven spheres idea from Cunningham and bright and blends them together and calls this the seven mountain mandate. And what I, what I'm arguing in the series though, is that there's a subtle shift there though. In, in your imagery, right? Because a sphere of influence is just this amorphous arena of influence. How do you, how do you affect a sphere of influence? I, I don't know. Go and be in it, right? Like it's not there's 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 nothing right. really clear yes. about that. Yeah. And and a sphere doesn't have a top, right? No, no, it doesn't. Well, like, I mean, I guess, but a sphere could, <laughs> you can flip it, and the top's on the other side, right? It's just it's just a sphere. It's just a ball. Right. A mountain has a top, and wall now. And then a, about a year after this, wall now meets Peter Wagner who hears about this idea from Waldo and they take it and they, they, they brand this thing as the seven mountain mandate. They publish books all over the place about it and spread it all over the charismatic world. But Waldo idea changes the, the image changes the, the concept because if you're conquering a mountain, if you need to take the top of the mountain, then influence is flowing down from the top of the mountain. And this is what they will say, right? The influence flows down from the top of the mountains. So Christians need to conquer the seven mountains. We need to take over the mountains. And then they'll say, and the top, if, the, if we are not on top of the mountains, then the sa- Satan and the demons are on top of the mountains. And so we need to displace the demonic powers that control the mountains so that Christians and the kingdom of God can rule over the mountains. And then influence will flow down. That is a very different model for how to change society. That is not a grassroots model for how to change society. That's a vanguard model for how to change society, right? That's a revolutionary model. We take over yes power and then we govern from the top and that creates kind of the political theology of the nar is this idea not just that we need to reform the church right that's how wagner kind of started out we need to reform the church we need apostles and prophets to lead the church it starts out in ecclesiology but then it very rapidly in the early 2000s becomes a political theology bent upon societal conquer so, so, so what, what are those seven? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Josh. But oh, you're what, good. What, what are those seven spheres, mountains um, that are included in there? I think you mentioned them, but but just yeah. just to, to reiterate, kind of what they are and and you know what the I don't know goal is in each of those areas. So the seven are. Let me let me. Uh, now you're testing me. <laughs> so it's it's family, religion. And, and, and sometimes they'll, they'll talk about religion as the church mountain, but they're, they're willing to acknowledge that because the seven mountains in their minds exist in every society, it's not, not only in America, right? Every society has the seven mountains. So it's family, government, arts and entertainment. Um, uh, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, <laughs> education. Media, education, media, yeah, and um, sometimes they sometimes they play around a little bit because sometimes they'll they'll it'll be like sports and technology, or just business and commerce. Uh, and am I still missing one? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's it, so so the, the basic idea is if you if you think about the different um, se- sectors of society in cabinet positions out of the federal government, right? Who are the cabinet ministers? Those more or less correspond to the seven mountains, um, without without necessarily the religion one. And the 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 critique in within this kind of seven mountains thing is that they, they say the church has only focused on the religion mountain. The church has only focused on becoming kind of dominant in religion, but instead Christians need to go into every sector of society and try to take it over. And and in Wagner's theology, it's actually apostles who have the strategy to take over the seven mountains. And so you, again, because apostles have this special role, right? They're, they have a specially ordained role. They can go and take the seven mountains. And so what you see in the Trump support, and you, you mentioned this, the Cyrus idea as well, these things are linked. So As Donald Trump enters the the presidential campaign in 2015, the summer of 2015, Lance Wall now is one of the first Christian leaders to actually meet with Donald Trump. And he he claims that in this meeting, he's already been promoting the Seven Mountains idea. It's his his kind of signature idea. He's spread it all over the place for 20 years. Um, And But at that time, when he meets Donald Trump, he claims that he has a vision that Donald Trump is a, a, a Cyrus. And if you remember your Hebrew Bible, Cyrus is the Persian emperor, right? So the Jews get conquered by the Babylonian Empire, the the kingdom of Judea, conquered by the Babylonian Empire. The Jewish leaders are taken into exile in Babylon. And then the Persian Empire conquers Babylon. And Cyrus is the Persian emperor, and he sends the Jewish leaders back to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And he's, he's, he's highlighted in Isaiah chapter 45 as a sort of Messiah, as somebody that God has anointed, even though he's this pagan emperor, God has anointed him for this purpose to restore the people of Judea. So what Walnow is saying there is that Donald Trump, even though he's not a good Christian, even though he's not a, 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 a religious person himself, but he has been ordained by God to restore conservative Christians from exile in American culture. And this is one of the most important theological rationales for Christian Trumpism. And then Peter Wagner adopts the same endorsement of Donald Trump, and then his inner circle really latches on to Donald Trump and becomes kind of the the premier champions of Christian Trumpism. Man, so it's it's awesome to hear like someone who really knows and done the research talk about it um, because there's just so much out there just gets thrown around and to make these connections it's it's really really cool um what do you think like so the a normal I, i say normal person but like someone sitting in the pews you know an american citizen i'm sure they would believe in things like freedom of religion. You know, they would say, yes, we believe in freedom of religion or, or, or any of these kinds of freedoms that we have, like put into our amendments. Um, do they deal with like the person sitting in the pew probably say, yeah, that's, that's awesome. But is there a apostle wondering, like thinking at the same time, no, we need to have, Christians running this country, Christian laws, Christian, like, like, what does it look like in the end? I guess like they're aiming to do what they're aiming to have. I know take them over and I get that, but they're aiming to have like, take them over and what, you know, ban pornography, outlaw, you know, uh, cigarettes and alcohol. Are they like, what are, are they in like, what is their plan? And, and yeah, I guess what, what are they really trying to accomplish and how do they deal with the issues of like religious liberty particularly? Because I, we talked to a, a gentleman who wrote a book, Christian, you know, a case for Christian nationalism. Mm-hmm. And I basically asked him like, so are people who are Muslim allowed, would they be allowed to have hold office? And he kind of like, skirted around the issue like yeah they you know yeah but they would have certain like restrictions when i don't remember exactly what he said but it wasn't like oh yeah absolutely they all they can have equal access and it's like is this what they're aiming at is that what they're doing like something like this is a christian land with christian laws because they essentially would have to like 
undo the Constitution in order to do that, it feels like. Or maybe not. What, 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 I don't know. Help me sort this out. Yeah, so let me let me maybe back up a little bit and do a little bit of more definitional work. Um, so we talk about Christian nationalism, right? And that phrase is um, very vague, right? And if you if you really look at the survey data um, that has come out on Christian nationalism, you really see a spectrum of views within what we would call Christian nationalism. So Pew did a big survey. Uh, came out, I believe, in October of 22. And um, they, they asked, do you think that the United States was founded as a Christian nation? And something in the, somewhere in the 60 percentile said, yes, the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation. And they said, do you think the U.S. should be a Christian nation today? It's something like 45% of Americans said the U.S. should be a Christian nation. And so you can read that and say, wow, look at all these, like Christian nationalism is taking over the United States. But then they asked follow-up questions. Well, do you think... The federal government should legislate based on Christian morality. And it's a very much smaller percentage. It's like 15% said yes to that. You think the, 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 the Supreme Court should use the Bible to make decisions? Like 10 to 15% of Americans. So I would say Christian nationalism, and this is my definition, you won't find it in, in agreement with all scholars who work on this stuff, but Christian nationalism is this kind of vague sentimental thing. Right up until the 1960s, I would argue, yeah, yeah, Protestantism was the de facto national religion of the United States. It really is the Supreme Court in the 1960s right. that starts to really create this disestablishment that we live with today. Right, the separation of church and state that we live with today, taking. Christian and Protestant prayer out of public schools, taking Bible reading out of public schools, allowing for abortion, right? All these things that are happening in the 1960s and early 1970s through the Supreme Court, through the, the Hart Seller Immigration Act in 1965 that opens the doors for all kinds of people who are not Christian to come into the United States, people immigrating from all over the world into the United States. So I think Christian nationalism is a holdover culturally from the rapid change that we've gone through in the last 60 years or so, where people feel like, wow, we've really changed a lot. And I kind of want vaguely something like what it was in the past that felt more Christian to me. But then when you ask those people, they, they don't really yeah. have a clear ideology. I talk about sure. Christian supremacy as a movement of organized, theologically driven approach to Christian nationalism, it's the extreme end of the Christian nationalist spectrum. And that's where I put, would put the NAR. I'd actually put Stephen Wolf in there as well, but that, that, that's, that's a kind of topic for another day. But the, so when right. these folks, when these folks talk about taking over nations, I, I interviewed Che on and asked him about this. So by the way, Che on speaks at the big rally in Washington, DC on January 5th, the day before the Capitol riot, he is there in Washington, DC during the Capitol riot. He claims that he sleeps through the Capitol riot. Um, but he gives this, this, <laughs> he, he gets up on stage, a huge crowd in freedom Plaza in Washington, DC on January 5th, on the eve of the insurrection. And he says, I am declaring right now that we are going to rule and reign through Jesus Christ or through Donald Trump and under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Right? So this is the language of the book of Revelation, right? Rule and Christians ruling and reigning. But he's saying, we are now, starting this week, are going to start ruling and reigning through Donald Trump and under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And I asked Cheon, I, and I, I, when I interviewed him, I said, you say you're going to disciple nations. But you say that we, the United States is not discipled now. How do you get from the state we are in now to where the United States is a discipled nation? And what happens to the rights of religious minorities in the midst of that? What happens to people who don't want to be Christian? And Cheon said, well, of course we believe in religious freedom. But when the nation is Christian, then you'll be free. <laughs> Whoa. Right? So th these folks, and, and, and Cheon, in, in November of 2020, so after the election, before January 6th, posted on Instagram and said, there is no separation of church and state. Because the government is one of the seven mountains. So the idea here is, no, they don't believe in separation of church and state. They, they, they might argue, well, sure, you can understand the First Amendment, but you, everyone's been interpreting it wrong. And Christians need to take over society. And they believe that there will be a great revival 
that will occur. They sometimes call it the third great awakening that will occur. Um, that they, many prophets have talked about this idea of a third great awakening and that that will spur on Christians to take over the governments. But these folks were marching in lockstep. They loved the agenda of the Trump administration. They loved when Donald Trump moved the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in Israel because they saw it as a fulfillment of prophetic destiny. They loved when Donald Trump installed the, the Supreme Court justices that he installed. In fact, some of these folks even came to D.C. to do spiritual warfare on behalf of Brett Kavanaugh during those contested hearings because they believed that God wanted Brett Kavanaugh to be on the Supreme Court and that they needed to do spiritual warfare to defend him against the accusations of sexual abuse that, he, that, that came up from Christine Blasey Ford. So for, from these folks' perspectives, Christians need to take over. And when I asked Che on this, it was basically yada, 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 discipled nation, right? They're, they're willing to leave a great ambiguity about the process. But in their minds, Christians are not only mandated, but are destined to take over societies in the name of Jesus, because in their minds, the, that is what the kingdom of God means, is that we take over society, that Christians exert a coercive influence over society, that Christians have a premier form of citizenship, and maybe other people can vote, but maybe their voices aren't welcome in the public square. Or maybe other people can hold office, but they need to swear that they will be loyal to Christian values, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of adding in these other layers to what it means to be American, to what it means to be Christian, and then saying that is normative in our society. And so Christians should have more privileges than other people. Well, so, so you know, one of the conversations Josh and I were, were having before we started recording was, you know, how do we look at, you know, Christian nationalism, the new apostolic reformation, um, like, like where do we kind of fit these in, you know, the, the, the good thing or the bad thing narrative. Mm. Um, so I, I'm curious if, if you can maybe, you know, provide some context on, you know, is, is, are, are the NAR folks, you know, uh, a force that needs to be stopped or is it like something that just needs to be observed? And if it does need to be stopped, you know, who, who or what groups, you know, are the ones that, that, that can or should stop it because. And I, how do they stop it? Yeah. And how do they stop it? Because like, I, I've, I've had this conversation with Josh on a number of occasions where, where I'm like, like my own personal opinion is that this needs to be sort of an inward out kind of movement by other believers, because if we, you know, if this becomes a full blown thing and, you know, yeah. they're covering it on CNN or MSNBC and, and then the government gets involved, like it's going to be messy and nobody's going to be happy. So, yeah, so I, 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 sure. I'd be curious to kind of get your, your take on that. Yeah. Let, let me be clear. I am, I profoundly believe in religious freedom and in pluralism. And I, I deeply yeah. believe that people need to have the freedom to believe what they believe and that people, that, that, that religious difference and the, the, the protection of that difference is crucial to life in America. So I am not by any means saying that the government should go and target the NAR or that we need to legally prosecute people just for their beliefs or any of those sorts of things, right? I, that, that, that is a far cry from where I am. I would argue, though, that um, this stuff mm. desperately needs to be exposed. Because I think, I, I actually think that yeah. um, part yeah. of how we get through this moment of crisis that we're in in the United States, and I really do think that we're in a moment of crisis. I think American Christianity, and I say this as a historical statement, I don't think American Christianity has been this politically and epistemically divided since we were on the eve of the Civil War, where you really do have two camps of Christians in America that see America, see our politics, see theology from completely different angles. And I think that part of how we defang Christian supremacy in the United States is not by going after it, right? not by creating new laws to go and prosecute these people. That, that actually would just play into their, their narratives about persecution, right? But I think part of it is trying to find a way to drive a wedge 
between that vague Christian nationalism, folks who are like, oh, yeah, I kind of wish America was more Christian. And then you ask them, so, so you think your Jewish friends should not have as many rights as you have as a Christian? Like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, so you think that the Supreme Court should, should make decisions based on biblical law? No, 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 no. Right? <laughs> that is the wedge that I think needs to be driven here. Because there are people who really do believe the Supreme Court should be making laws based on the Bible or making decisions based on the Bible, that the government should be legislating based on Christian morality. In fact, there was a survey that was just done a couple months ago by a sociologist named Paul Jupe. He's at Denison University. Um, and he actually asked questions about the Seven Mountain Mandate. And he found that more than 20% of Americans said they believe that Christians need to take over the seven mountains of culture. This is the day that 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 phrase, the seven mountains of culture, did not exist 25 years ago. It literally did not exist 25 years ago. That was still people were still talking about seven spheres of society. But when you even phrase it with that specific Lance Wall now phrase about seven mountains, more than a fifth of Americans today say, yeah, Christians need to take over the seven mountains. That's how rapidly and how far that idea has spread. Yeah. Right? The word mandate says a lot. It does. Yeah. So yeah. The, yes, these. I, I think we need to find. You can't. You can't have a pluralistic society if forty-five percent of the population says they're not playing along, right? That just doesn't work. And so we need to find ways to look at that fifteen, ten to twenty percent, however you want to count it specifically, of Americans who apparently are on board with Christian takeover of the United States, and say that is a fringe position. Part of the problem is that today. Christian nationalists, in this kind of vague, sentimental sense, are making common cause with Christian supremacists and voting with them because they, the Christian nationalists don't feel threatened by the Christian supremacists. Yeah. And they don't recognize the threat that it is to our society. Mm. Yeah, that, that's so wild. Oh, I, mean, I mean, well, Matt, I... I could probably talk to you for another couple of days. Um, yeah, we're going to have to get another time. <laughs> I have so many questions, but I have to, yeah, we, we probably can't go much longer. Yeah, so so, uh, so thank you so much for uh, for spending some time with us. Um, this has been very, very educational. And uh, yeah, and just, you know, congratulations on the success of the uh, podcast series. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure I put a link to it in our in our show notes for if anybody's Definitely. interested. Um, but, uh, thank you. But yeah, thank Thanks again uh, for, for everything you do. Happy to be here and happy to come back. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. So to all of our faithful politics listeners and viewers, we will.